So, welcome. Boy, it's good to see you, Josh. We ain't out in that sun, huh? Good to have you shoveling that rock. And it's good to see you, brother. God bless you, man. Welcome. Josh was my helper the other day when I was out there shoveling rock, and he came out, and it was like, I thought he had wings. I thought he even had a halo. Like an angel just showed up. It was hot. But we had a cheerleader, though, Gordy. He was cheerleading. That's good. Well, to mor- the, today on our the morning prayer call, so many of you are are connected to us on the morning prayer call, and some of you can't connect with us, and we understand. <clears throat> I opened up in prayer this morning, and I opened up with, with Chronicles um, 7.14. And after this was all done throughout the day, my wife goes, you know, that was a perfect prayer for today. I said, really? <laughs> and she goes, yeah, today's date is 7.14. Of course, my prophetic mind didn't pick it up. Hers did. Oh, there we go. <clears throat> so, I thought it was only, I thought it was only the right thing to do for me to bring in what I brought only a couple weeks ago. So some of this may sound familiar because I opened up on a Saturday night with this exact thing. But it's so prevalent to the times that we're in. We all know that this world is in mayhem and in a bad time and we're all worried about which direction it's going to go. We have rioting in the streets. We have police officers being beaten to the point that they're in the hospitals. We have, how many of us know that there was a funeral for an officer today? Right here in Phoenix. It's a sad, sad thing that when an officer goes down in Arizona, It's usually something everybody knows, but it's really funny that it's been quieted down this time. An officer went down and it was silenced. It's an awful thing. To me, it's no different than one of our American soldiers that give his life for this country. It's the same thing when an officer goes down that has a badge upon his shirt. And I'm not just saying that for my ties. I felt this way from the very beginning as a little child. It was heartbreaking to me when I found out that a, an officer went down for some reason. And one thing I always commended Arizona about is any time it happened, there was a huge parade. There was firemen and there were firefighters and there were fire trucks and there was ambulance and there was every police car in the state that could get away, would get away for a moment to get there. Today, that didn't happen. Today, it wasn't quite like that. It was just a quiet little funeral, as if it was grandma's day that she's, you know, lived a long life and was over. Unfortunately, it was a a young man that, well, he wasn't, he was middle-aged, but he was still an officer of the law. Should have been represented loudly the horn should have been going off. So with stuff like that going into the world, and then our schools being defunded, just, just two years ago, a year and a half ago, we were all worried about our children going to school, and there were police officers at the door. And we were worried about the crazies of this state and these nations coming in with guns and shooting our children. Now we're welcoming them. We're asking them to come. Because we're we're telling them, we're putting a big sign up out front and saying, we have no police here. Come on in. You realize how much, I don't know if you guys know, MS-13. MS-13 has been trying to invade schools for years. Bringing drugs into the 
to influence the young men in the, in the high schools. They've been, we, they've caught them all across the schools down on the, the, the eastern border. I mean, our, our southern border. All of them, all the schools down there, they've caught MS-13 people trying to come into the schools. Who caught them? The officers that work the schools. And now we're removing them. What a shame. What a shame. We just got to keep in mind that the righteous right hand of God is in control. Keep in mind we know how the story ends. In Ecclesiastes 1.9 it says there is nothing new under the sun. So the Lord knows what he's doing. He knows how to handle these, these situations. And, and Corinthians, or Chronicles 7.14, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and then turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. Praise the Lord. That's what we're after. We need him to come in and heal the land. We need to have these funerals and the things that are going on today that were just silenced rise back up. We need to rise up and take the authority that the church is supposed to take. It's a sad thing whenever I have a pastor say something on uh, Facebook and I simply tell him because he's from California, it's time that the church fights a righteous fight and stand up and fight. And I got beat up for just saying that. And it comes from the church. It comes from someone that sits in a pew that goes, oh, but. But the truth of the matter is, them are not people that read the Word of God. We need to read the Word and stand upon the Word and remember that we are the hands and feet of Jesus. We are the hands and feet of Jesus. And sometimes the hands and feet of Jesus need to stand up and war. When I was writing this, I looked over into my closet and I was reminded of some things. You see, in our closet, I, I ripped out the closet in my office and turned it into a, a sitting area so we can do prayer in this room. And on the back wall where I have lights shining on them, I put some stickers on the wall to remind us of some things. And it says this, Painful moments, trust God. Difficult moments, seek God. Quiet moments, worship God. Happy moments, praise God. Every moment, thank God. Heavenly Father, during these times of trials and tribulation, Lord, we know that it seems like every time we raise our hand, somebody's ready to take us out. But Father God, we know that the church needs to rise. And we need to rise with the righteous right hand. Not condemning, Lord. Not violently. But a righteous right hand. And sometimes that righteous right hand has a sword, Father God. A sword that's wielded properly. And in that sword is your word, Father. Father, there's people out there that are just running rampant that need to hear your word. We pray that you would soften their hearts, Lord, and open their ears. And stop the running violently. Father God, slow them down. Bring your people back, Lord. Rise them up. And strengthen them. And we'll give you all the praise and all the honor. In Jesus' mighty name.
there was a stirring in here a little bit as everybody was coming in there was just this this crowded stirring feeling up here uh, Ernie kind of pointed it out and I was kind of feeling something just moving and just almost like it wanted to suck the oxygen out of the air it's kind of the way I felt to me and I know I know what we are doing here is we're really plowing through some things that's going to open the eyes of people so it's only natural for the enemy to want to come in and squeeze the life out of us so I just want to pray before Ernie gets up here and I just want to pray that there's no buffeting Father God I just stand up here Lord as Ernie's headship as the headship over spirit wind healing ministries and I want to take authority. I take authority up over this house. I take authority up over this podium. I take authority up over this area. And I say, no, you have no authority. No one, nothing has any authority that thinks it has the right. Let's start that over. Father God, I just know that the, the enemy is trying to buffet behind this podium tonight. And he wants to, to snuff out the breath of the pastor, Father God. And I say, no, it will not happen on my watch. I stand in my authority and I say no. Anything foul or unclean that thinks it has a right to sneak into this house, I tell you to go in Jesus' mighty name. You have no rights to come in and try to stop the word of God from going out. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Come on up. I believe we're going into chapters 2 and 3 of the end of day's battle, right? Yeah, I pulled it up hoping you'd get it, but you didn't. Oh, I did not. Was it reading my mind yet again? No, I was not. That would be divination. <laughs> oh, he's learning. Proud of you, so, Pastor? There you go. All right, so we are so short-handed with the people helping us out that things like the offering are being forgotten <laughs> so if you don't mind we're going to receive an offering now so we can be done with that and get focused on our teaching um, we want to welcome everybody on facebook um just welcome you <laughs> i actually put a couple links on facebook i don't know if they're working like links because i'd hurry up and do them but that is where you can give if you want to give and so into this ministry um, father we thank you lord for the givers and those who are keeping us actively running paying the rent paying the bills keeping us printing books and doing the things that we need to do. And most of all, Lord, those who are helping us to sow into other countries, Father. And so even now, we pray for those other countries. We pray for the bread uh, factory in um, Venezuela, Lord, and the pastor who got hurt and injured and had to have surgery. And Father, we pray for her quick healing and quick recovery so that they can get back to feeding the hungry in Venezuela. And we pray, Father, for their needs to be met, for that machine that they have to get. We pray for all finances to come through for them. And Father, we pray for Kenya and um, Apostle Joshua, Lord, and their churches opening back up in Kenya and all the the stipulations that Africa has put on them. And we just pray, God, that you'll make it a smooth ride and you'll make a way where it looks like there is no way for them to finance the opening of their churches, Lord. We know that you are a good, good God. We thank you that here in America, we are still walking on freedom. And Lord, we, re we will not give it up. We refuse to allow that to be taken away from us by any devil or any government or anything else, Lord. We are just grateful that you chose this place for us. Father, we pray for this offering, God, to go far and wide and that you would make us good stewards of it. We pray for everyone that would give, Lord, and has given, that, God, you would bless them in everything in every area, financially and physically and spiritually and emotionally, that they need to have you tend to them. We ask that you will do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you need an offer, uh, envelope, April, we'll, we'll grab you one or somebody else will. <laughs> Jeez. Um, so you can give on Zelle, you can give to PayPal me, paypal.me slash spirit, S-W-H-M revival, or anything else up there. Whew, okay. So as you can tell, it's like the most overlooked thing for me. It's like, i got to focus more on that, but you guys are great givers. You don't even have to be asked. You just give, so. 
I should just stop and say, this is giving time. That's your opportunity. And you'll just do it because you're all so good at it. Amen. All right. Well, welcome to those of you brave people who left your house tonight. Good job. <laughs> it's not easy getting out in this cuckoo world, is it? But you did it. So right there speaks freedom. Just saying. Right there speaks freedom. So while you guys are doing the offering, I'm going to just pray a few more minutes. We had something come up this morning, and I had wondered when I got off the phone with this something if it wasn't a little assignment of something. Now I'm wondering even more if it wasn't an assignment of something. I'm thinking it may have been. We'll just see. <laughs> so I'm just going to break that something, right? In Jesus' name. Father, thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to continue to raise up with your children, Lord, your sons and daughters that are growing in your word, that are growing in warfare, that are becoming leaders, Lord, in every sphere of influence that you put them in. I pray, Lord, that as I speak this word, that it goes out with fire power, Lord, the Holy Spirit, fire power. That you would make us ready, God. And if there is anything to what we've been hearing, Lord, by the end of this year for the rushing in of the lost and desperate people, we are going to need to be ready. So raise us up, Father, that we are fearless and we will take on the challenges in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, yes, there is a rumor going around that, um, I forget the guy's name. It's Dr. I'm going to butcher his name, but it's. Some of you have seen it. It's K-Y-N-A-N. Uh, he's not a doctor. Doc I mean, he's a doctorant, but he's not a physical doctor. But anyway, he was, he's the one who had the dream about Trump lately. Anybody seen him? Goodness, I actually know something you guys didn't send to me. Somebody sent it to me. <laughs> I don't know. It's, whoever it was, it's in the room. But anyway, he was talking about this dream. It's really good. You guys got to hear this word. It's, he ended up on Sid Roth with the dream today. So he was talking about the dream, and um, all I can remember that really hit me was right towards the end of something he was saying was that he had had this vision of an influx of people coming and filling the churches out of desperation. And that got me because that is a vision I've had for at least two or three years longer than that since we were with another ministry I had had those visions and I really knew that the Lord was trying to train us to prepare us how to receive those kind of desperate people these are not going to be easily touched people I I get, I get phone calls from people coming out of witchcraft that was really exciting um, people that are you know firsthand turning their lives around in this chaos so this is really good and I'm sure there's a lot more out there that I haven't talked to but others have so the lost are going to come in and the harvest is going to be had but are we ready for that so that's a lot of what these classes are about uh, in the warfare department and, and out of this book specifically is to talk about the co-ops <laughs> that we, we talked about some of this last week, the co-ops that are taking place in the natural and in the spiritual. And last week we talked about a little bit about the Black Lives Matter, Satanic Temple, and the LGBT all connected, okay, and how are they connected. So we did discuss that. We also began in chapter one of the End of Days Battle book about um, Ephesians 6.12, and we talked about, we got up to darkness and so we're going to pick up on at that place in chapter two and break down continue to break down those definitions so <clears throat> i first want to start with simply confessing that satan is defeated is not going to be enough it's not enough to uh that his defeat to be apparent in our lives and our communities just saying it how many of you hear those people sick devil is a liar yes Okay, he is a liar. He's the father of lies, which means everything that people are believing that's a lie are children of the father of lies. What are we going to do about it? Right? Uh, right? Uh, ever hear of those people, the battle is the Lord's? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. But how does he battle? What are we going to do about it? He, we are to partake in these things. Um, I hear a lot of times, you know, you're healed in the name of Jesus. Uh, devil ain't got no power. Devil's roaming around like a roaring toothless lion. Yada, yada, yada. We've heard it all. But that is, those are things that Satan has got us parroting to keep us defenseless. Because without knowledge, we perish. If we don't know the devil's out to get someone, we don't know how to pray. It's a specific kind of prayer. So we want to go from personal stuff in this next five weeks. Personal is good. We did personal for five months. Now we're going to go high level, more corporately and more for our country. And I don't think it's a coincidence that we landed here in this season. We have got to pray. The cool thing was 
everybody's got a prayer movement going right now. And we started in February or March. So I was like, we are ahead of the game. We were on this. So I was really excited about that as I got to think about how we're on it already. We're, we're readily, I mean, most of you are on that call. Th this is a good sign that we're already advancing. We've advanced in the last four or five months farther than others who have taken a while to get the message that it was time to pray. Not that it wasn't time to pray five years ago. So anyway, congratulations. You've heard from the Lord and you jumped on the prayer wagon. So <clears throat> what I believe that these lies are that we are hearing about the enemy, it, it's very reflective of the anemic state of the church that we see today, right? And sin infused society that this world has become because the devil's a liar period and that's that's all I need to know devil's a liar he's got no teeth he ain't gonna hurt me and in the meantime you know I, I have this word that I haven't put out yet but it really I know that for you guys in here who are chasing the Lord it wouldn't affect you but if you think about the majority of the people sitting in a church pew um, I say pew I know that's old-fashioned dates me doesn't it church chair say church chair and uh, <laughs> anyway and they're sitting in a church chair and they are um, <clears throat> drinking, smoking, fornicating, living together, amongst other things. And they say they love God, and they say that they're free, and yet clearly they're in bondage, because that's all anti-God. And if they knew that they could be in bondage to a demon, perhaps they would get up and go, I don't want to be in bondage to a demon anymore. Perhaps they won't. Perhaps they'll like their flesh and they'll go that way. But I think a lot of times people sit in their bondage because they have no clue that there is a bondage keeper. Somebody's keeping them in bondage. Amen. Okay. So verse uh, chapter 19, we're going to go back to verse Ephesians 6, 12. For we wrestle not, that's what this whole book is about. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Reminding you... Um, that said in high places, another version says in heavenly places. So I refer back to Ephesians 6, 12 as we continue to look at a few more of these words and then go forth. But when we look at the words principalities, powers, and rulers in the Greek, we can learn some things that we do not immediately see in the English context. We have read this verse a thousand times over, but probably never broke it down. And it's when you break it down that you see the power of the demonic kingdom of Satan. When you break these words down. So the spiritual world's sphere of activity is above the earth. That's where they, they compile their plans and their strategies. But of course they come here. They come to you to influence you. Demonic, demonic spirits do. The spiritual world's sphere of activity is above the earth and it's, a, and it's an orderly world. And this is one of the things we're trying to teach you because it's one thing to do deliverance and healing, self-deliverance and healing, work within your own system here and your own issues and your own problems. But we have to look at what is influencing you because you have a problem, because you have a demonic problem. And who can rule and reign over you and take over an area or a sphere of influence? Who is the strong man that's able to operate over you or use you as a strong man or a woman? So an orderly world with Satan as a ruler who can seize, we learned this last week, uh, retain, obtain, take, keep, or lay hold of the inhabitants of this world that are not submitted to God. When you broke, you guys, if for you who didn't see this class last week, just read the first chapter. That's what I'm talking about as we broke it down. He enlists principalities to rule a region or a nation. All right, and he enlists powers and spiritual hosts of wickedness to enforce the assignments. Everything we broke down last week. Satan can do this because of the state of darkness or ignorance, and we see it in our world right now, that people are in with regards to the divine things of God, as well as the accompanying, the accompanying ungodliness and immorality of the people of this world. Again, what we are seeing. So the powers of the demonic kingdom of Satan have a delegated influence this is you get because I feel like there's like some kind of a haze just coming over y'all y'all okay okay so if <laughs> if the haze starts to come over you somebody wave and go I can't see anymore uh, that's what I thought the powers <laughs> I'm gonna beat some devil in a minute come on get up let's go uh, the powers of the demonic kingdom of Satan have a delegated influence and authority and jurisdiction of which they exhibit their power and their strength with force 
over territories and the people in them using principalities as chiefs or leaders. Now, we broke all these words down. So if you want to get that in you to help you understand it in chapters 1 and 2, they're all broken down. You'll be able to see that very clearly. Um, when... Uh, <laughs> I forgot how bad this class can, how bad, how much of a battle it can be. So, for example, let's look at Seattle. I'm not, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna camp here, but let's look at Seattle, Washington, and let's look at Atlanta. Okay, the devil thrives on blood. The di devil thrives on sin, on murder, on those places that have given him power, where there's high level sin. Okay, how do we know that? Well, because we see it all through the Bible, where the high places and they offered and they ran children through the fire and all that kind of stuff. Seattle, Washington, in that area where BLM came over. I want you to think about this. That place was taken over. That place was taken over by broken people and people that would be considered those like Belial, which are wicked men, and the spirits that were allowed to be there and take the territory, and they held it. I want you to just think they held that ter territory. What would you do if it was your neighborhood? <coughs> Imagine walking outside and finding that, that kind of chaos. Imagine driving down the street and a bunch of men with masks and, and don't make me say this wrong, A-R, yes, thank you. Uh, they're coming up to the, I never get those numbers right, but they're coming up to you and they're just telling you flat out, white person, where's my reparations? Or whatever else they might be saying. Think about that fear and that terror. Okay, so now that's more fuel. So somehow, and I believe the prayers of the saints helped to back this Seattle thing down, but I don't think they took the territory. I just think they backed it out. And so that's okay, back it out, but you can't stop fighting. You can't come short once it stopped. And actually, that's why we were reading, that's why we were reading 2 Kings. Chapter 13, was it 2 Kings, right? Elijah told the king to uh, shoot the arrows out the window and to shoot at Syria. But he didn't tell him how many times he said, shoot till you've destroyed. And the king only shot three times, right? Well, what did that do? That he says, well, that's, that's going to be the amount of victory you get, bottom line. That'll be that you are to stay with it till you destroy it. And the problem with the body of Christ is we get a tiny breakthrough and then we quit. And God's been telling me this like for two weeks, myself included. We get a little breakthrough, we move on to the next thing. If you're ADD, ADD, it's really difficult because you can't stay focused on any prayer. And so you get that prayer out, you go to the next prayer and you go to the next prayer. But we got to stay focused until we take the strong man out. All we're doing is pushing some stuff back. But we got to stay with it till we get the fullness of the territory. Well, how do you know you're going to get the fullness of the territory? You're going to begin to get the harvest. Amen? Okay. Whew. Preaching with fire tonight. I can feel it. It's hot up here. All right. So, going on. Continuing on page 20. We can see that the kingdom of darkness, that's what I was going to say. So, the kingdom of darkness, uh, the, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. And the violence, take it by force. Look at the definition here, how they exhibit their power and strength with force over territories. If the demonic is being forceful, we have to be forceful. We just have to figure out how to do that. Forceful in prayer, forceful with the word of God, using the arrows of the word of God to shoot the enemy down. So we can see that the kingdom of darkness, Satan has an orderly hierarchy. And this is why you can't miss this class. If you do miss this class, you need to read the book or you'll get lost. Um, the book's an easy read. You can have it done in a day. And uh, so he has an orderly hierarchy of spirits that have specific areas and duties to fulfill in order to keep the kingdom of heaven from advancing. And if you were on the, time, if you were on the uh, call, you saw where I said there was a timeline and it was on the top was God's uh, timeline. And on the bottom was Satan's timeline. And he was there to keep God from advancing. Not that he's ever going to have victory over the Lord. We know that. But there is a battle. And we can't just sit and watch the battle play out. We have to do it. So, so in this timeline, we have to figure out where God is at in his timeline. And what our battle is to choose. Because Satan is trying to keep heaven from advancing. So these evil spirits plot to cause men to sin. I'm going to say this slow so you can really get what I'm saying. To commit iniquity and malice as well as lead them into depravity. Because of the original fall of Adam, we're now born into a state of sin. We all know that. Whereas the ruler of this world has the freedom to oppress us because of it. Unless we are saved and walking it out with God. We can't just get saved by a prayer and not walk out. 
the rest of it. So, Satan counterfeits everything, and his goal is to, as you know, still kill and destroy everything he can. And that's in John 10, 10. He, he is not an author of anything except for lies. According to the word of God, he is the father of lies. Our authority is taken from us when we sin and allow the enemy to rule and reign over our lives. The devil's authority is given to him because we choose not to walk in ours. Amen? Okay, so that right there should be enough to go, what are we missing here? What, what is our authority that we need to take? I could tell you the warfare over this class tonight is intense. So some of you may need to pray in the spirit every so often to just keep this rolling. Um, w one of the ways, and I'm not going to go into it tonight, is to figure out how the enemy uses us to stay in a territory. We talked about that last week, I think, with the gatherings. And so the man of the tombs, you know, that was a strong man. That was a place where he, that man was a portal and all the demons could be there and take that entire ter territory and had a body to be in. Um, believe me, they probably wanted to not have to share a body with that many, but, but they did and they don't care. So long as they have somebody that they can make connection with, I'll say it like this. I'm going to say like uh, soul ties. You guys should know about soul ties. Or I'll say ley lines, a place of invisibility, but it's a place where the devil is able to travel. And these are, and I'm not teaching on that tonight, but I will teach on that to give you more understanding. But let's say you have a problem such as pride, um, rejection, and you have, you, you've been fornicating. You've been, you're, and you're a Christian. And you're in church and you're serving God and everything looks good on the outside, but you're really promiscuous or you're, you're an alcoholic or something like that. You got bondage. The enemy that is the strong man over a certain uh, a, a chunk of demonic spirits is looking for a person like that to get in that church. Okay, that's how come so many churches fall. That's how come many church, how many, how come so many churches give in to Jezebel. Because she has that spirit will ha bring somebody that has gifts and talents, but enter in just so they can begin to destroy from the inside out. That's how it works. So why is it important that we know this? We don't want to have anything in common with the devil. Okay, moving on to page 21. God's kingdom is, I'm not reading all this book, just so you know, I'm only pulling out what we need to learn about, especially since we have so much information. So God's kingdom is organized with an order of angelic beings designed to do his will. And we know this for several reasons throughout the Bible, we see angels represented by various names like seraphim, cherubim, archangels, and all those kind of things. We talked about that last week too, listed in the Bible, but each one has a specific job. The scriptures also tell us that all our ministering angels are spirits. Let me tell you what I heard from that today. So are the demonic angels ministering angels. Two reasons why I say that. First of all, kingdom, the, the kingdom of Satan needs servants to Satan. And that's what they are. And then second, Paul said, even if an angel of light brings you a message different than the gospel. So they're ministering too. Who are we listening to? And religious spirits are ministering really quite well in the church right now, which is why we keep hitting that so much on the call, because there's nothing more aggressive than a religious spirit. That could be Jezebel, that could be Antichrist or anything. So there are guardian angels as well, angels that carry out God's judgments and even angels of death. Each group of angels has specific duties relating to the kingdom of heaven and fulfills them on heaven on earth. So we want to work with those angels without getting all kooky and weird and, you know, being in a tight knit relationship with those angels. We just want to acknowledge that they're there and we want to be cautious because we're not that good at seeing in the spirit. We don't want to accidentally welcome the wrong angels. So we want to ask God to be in charge of his angels. God to send his angels for because they're his angels. They do his bidding. Amen. There are a lot of people who demand the angels and I always my skin crawls when people do that. I'm like there's nothing scriptural to tell us we can command angels. Jesus can command the angels. That's his thing. We just w work with it, all right? So going into that, the, continuing into Ephesians 6, 12, the word darkness. That word is, uh, page 22, that word is translated from the Greek skotos, meaning shadiness, obscurity. And then Thayer's Greek lexicon defines the word as a metaphor relating, this is so interesting to me, relating to the ignorance with respect to divine things. So people who are unaware of divine things or human uh, and human duties as, as Christians and the accompanying 
ungodliness and immorality together with their consequent misery in hell. And you have to let that sink in or read it again. And common English just simply means that the darkness referred to in Ephesians 6.12 may mean that due to the sins of the people, certain things, certain deities, certain divine things can remain in the darkness where these principalities rule. And I'm break it down real super simple. Just like I said about uh, Seattle, Washington. If there's a ruling area pocket of sin, say it's a, a gang and they have taken over a territory or it's an abortion clinic or something that is a hot spot for demonic activity period that's going to be their hub and they're going to go out from there to inject whatever they're trying to inject into the other areas okay so ephesians 6 is uh let me see the terms the rulers of darkness uh, by definition suggests an order an orderly arrangement of demonic spirits that are able to retain and seize and keep people in the dark i mean come on how can people not see what we see how can people honestly say some of the things that they're saying about the state of the world how can so many people turn on each other over silly things like mike was talking about the mass and stuff and the and, and social media has allowed for no filters and no boundaries so people can just hit you beat you up say whatever they want to say on there and have absolutely no regard no respect even if you're the president of the united states they could say now that is a nation that has become like this over the last 20 years this is not who america was designed to be um, there's a relationship between an individual living in sin in darkness and the demonic spirits allowed to rule those areas that's why deliverance is so important and i think the reason it's gotten to this degree is because we haven't done deliverance in the church for so long Ch christians and i gave you guys the stats this will be my third time at telling you 50 percent of millennials according to barna research have left the church 35 percent of um, gen x and 25 percent of baby boomers since covid why i couldn't do that i couldn't leave the church i couldn't leave the teaching i couldn't leave the fellowship if i'm truly knitted into that body right but these people have left tells you a lot about what's going on so but the bible does say this in colossians 2 15 that jesus has a disarmed principalities and powers and he made a spectacle of them triumphing over them so why in the world does the devil have so much power if Satan, uh, Jesus disarmed him. I don't know if you ever think about that scripture, but he did. He did disarm him, but we gave him his armor back. We gave him back everything he needed. Think about it. We, can't, we cannot dine at the same table with Satan and, and um, Jesus, right? We can't, we're not allowed to do that. We, we're to wash our hands, purify your hearts, you sinners, and come out of the darkness into the marvelous light that God called us into. So Jesus may have disarmed the devil, but the church is living in bondage and acting as if they're the ones who disarmed. They've never been disarmed. They gave it up. Identity in Christ Jesus, along with his positional authority, is given to us. It's how we walk in victory and not defeat. But Christians, Christ, most Christian churches do not teach this subject for fear of being weird or losing attendees. The truth is an occupied pew I want you to hear this. God, I remember when God told me this. The occupied pew is still an empty one if the individual is powerless. Right? So Satan has deceived us. He's deceived us into believing that he has all authority to build up and tear down as if he were God. He even tried to deceive Jesus Christ. And what do you think he was representing when he came to Jesus? First, when he came to Adam and Eve, and did God really say? Then when he comes to Jesus and uh, tries to exchange these kingdoms he had to offer Jesus for Jesus's um, worship. It says in Luke 4, 5 through 7, then the devil taking him up on a high mountain. Now, I don't know if he did that in his mind. I don't know if he threw some vain imaginations in there made it look like that or if he literally brought him up jesus was in a weak state in his body he was in a strong state in his spirit but a weak state in his body uh, and he showed him satan showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and the de that's quick that's a flash right and uh, and the devil said to him all this authority i will give you and their glory for this has been delivered to me and i will give it to whomever i wish therefore if you will worship me uh, and all of this will be yours if Satan would approach Jesus and have this kind of exchange and conversation with him, if he's that bold in referencing Jesus, how much more bold do you think he is with us? And how often are we even picking up on it? Earlier today, I was hearing something and I was like, I engaged with the thought I was hearing. 
for a minute and then I was like, oh, well, this, that's the devil. The devil's talking to me. It, it took me a minute because I don't slow my thoughts long enough to catch them, but I happened to catch this one and I was like, that is a lie. And I don't care, get thee behind me, Satan. But I was able to get it, right? And it didn't affect me emotionally. It didn't tap into my system. It just went. It, I heard it in my ear and then I cast it out. I was alert and I was attuned to know that he's coming in here to hit us somewhere. So he's going to hit somewhere. So that was, that's really cool. And that's really where we know we're strengthened when we can do that. When we can hear those thoughts trickle in by go, uh, that don't line up with God. I'm not doing that, right? Now, I'm going to give you a few more things. Uh, I want to just, you know, we already know this. God is sovereign. He is om omnipresent. He's omnipotent and has all authority in this world, period. He just does. Uh, the world and all that is within it is his. And at some point, every knee will bow to the King Jesus. Okay. Why we have to go through all this, it's all written. You want, you want to ask those questions, to the, you need to ask them to God because I don't have all those answers. So Jesus referred to Satan. And I want you to hear this because... Um, well, the enemy has power, and I hate to say that because, you know, I don't like to contribute to him, but more and more and more, we are giving more over to the natural world, more over to the psychology world, and less over to the spiritual world. Am I right? Way too much is going into the, the spheres of psychology. That's intentional. They're doing it in the schools. You know these schools, I don't know if you know who the latest, but um, was it Illinois passed a law on the school system to teach the history of LGBT. And what do you think about that? If you're living in, in Illinois, you have a small child, they will be forced to sit under indoctrination because that's all that is. So why is that? Well, we know we have to suffer the consequences of our laziness and our sinfulness. You know, our parents messed up and didn't raise us up in the Lord. So we missed our mark and our opportunity to have a voice in that decade that we could have had a voice. Amen. Some of us, maybe not all of you. Then others just didn't do anything about it because they didn't know what to do. And so now we're at this point where I think we're at a tipping point in the church. We don't have a choice now. We got to find somebody who knows something that can help us do something. Okay, I know what I know and you know what you know. We need to find out what you know to help us do what we know we need to do. Amen. <laughs> that is good. That worked. That rolled. So anyway, it says uh, Jesus himself referred to Satan in John 12, 31 as the ruler of this world. Paul calls him, put all this together. Paul calls him the prince of the power of the air, Ephesians 2, 2, and the God of this world in 2 Corinthians 4, 4. And John makes a further distinction when he says, we know that we are of God and the whole world is in the power of the evil one. First John 5, 1 John 19. The English Standard Version says it that way. Other versions would say under the sway of the wicked one or under the control of the evil one. You want to make somebody mad? Tell them they're not a child of God and then quote the scripture to them. You want, I know, not that we want to go around making people mad, but maybe you do. Maybe you just want to shake them up a little bit. Well, I'm God's child. Every creature is God's child. No, every creature is God's creation. It's a big difference. But the world's been indoctrinated. Well, God loves you. He'll never turn his back on you. Well, how many people you know jumped out of the hand of God? We don't ever talk about leaping out of the hand of God, taking a nosedive straight to the concrete where the pool is empty. We can do that. As people, it isn't hard for us to say it looks better over there and take a dive out. We can jump from God's hand nobody talks about this stuff but we need to talk about it because we have such a false grace out there that we've lost all these generations so try not to additionally preach on top of what I got to share so okay going down we're still on page 24 Satan principalities and powers of demonic wickedness do have some authority and rule scriptures say so for Christians it's different or it should be I shouldn't say it is because too many too many believers are living in sin um, but we see by their definitions in these scriptures, but they do have only what God allows them to have. And I think also what we allow them to have. So I think we have to go a little bit farther than that because our willful misconduct and transgression against God's holy standards are the invitation to demonic powers and, and them gaining entrance into our lives. Does that make sense? our willful, willful misconduct. And, and we're going to pray at the end of this that we would receive an infilling um, against that, okay? 
Uh, Jesus Christ came to expose. This is like one of my favorite places to go. We talk about this all the time, exposing darkness. Jesus came into the world to expose the darkness and not entangle us with it. Okay, so there is a way to like be back here, expose the darkness and not get tangled up in it. When God created the world, the first thing he did was separate the light from the darkness. He didn't remove darkness. He separated it. And he did that with us as well. He called us out of darkness into the marvelous light so that we could proclaim his praises. So we have to think about why did God just destroy the darkness? He did that once. He did that once. But you got to understand what this darkness means. And I'm going to show you what this darkness means. And God saw that the light was good. Then he separated the light from the darkness. Uh, Gen Genesis 1-4. God saw that the light was good, separated from the darkness. This word darkness is defined in the concordance as misery, destruction, death, and wickedness. It's the same darkness that's in that sin in the Ephesians 6-12. That's the darkness still operating here. But God pulled us out of there. God caused light to enter in and darkness to push back. This is, we are the light. We are the city on the hill. We are the ones that to get up and push back the darkness so we can gain the territory. Thank you for praying, guys. I'm feeling it. It's holding up. <clears throat> and you know who you are. So Jesus came to use us as the light force to push back the darkness. We already know. You walk in, you, any light comes into dark. And dark moves dark isn't going to be there anymore i get up a lot at night and i i have these focal points <laughs> where light might be shining so i don't walk into the walls sometimes mike removes my focal point out of the hallway <laughs> so i walk into walls and i feel my way all the way down our house is very dark then I, and i'm so good at this now that i can take that night light and stick it in the i hope i never shock myself but i can just stick it in the wall and go ah, let there be light the dark has moved away from the toilet which is really all i need <laughs> so i know a little too much but but the point is, is i get up and i have my focal points and really my office is lit up like you know Vegas in there if you ever go in there but I try to shut that door I don't like that focal point but you know you get up your eyes adjust to the darkness but as you move into it and get closer to where that focal point is it gets brighter and brighter and brighter and you can see clearer so we need to pick our dark battles and begin to press into them with our light because our light is stronger than any darkness so we're to have nothing to do with, well, that was good. That was right into this. Ephesians 5.11 says, we have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. The writer continues with this sentiment. He says this in verse 12. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it said, wake up sleeper, rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Let me give you an example. How many of you know about TED Talks? Okay, so I don't like TED Talks. I'm not afraid to tell anybody I don't like them because I followed them every so often. I check in and I never hear anything healthy coming out of there. I just think people get a podium out there. They have an advancement to make. And lately it was, it's been the pedophiles and the homosexuals. When the pedophiles can come out on a TED Talks, get hand clapping for abusing children and all they're doing is training children how to have sex, we are living in a sick world beyond imagination. The difference is it's in our face on our internet, but it was happening way back when Jezebel was doing it. It was, it was happening way back when every other nasty religion was doing this to children. It's just that it's different now because we live in a, in a culturized society that would never think that is possible ever, but it's happening. And why is it allowed to be out there on a TED talk show and promoted now? Because we laid down because we stopped praying, because we stopped protecting our children. Do you guys think that God won't deal with us for not protecting children? Honestly, let's be real. You know what he says about that, right? Better be tied around your neck with a millstone. I don't want a millstone around my neck. We can, we can undo this. I know that we can. I know that God will make a way, but we are living in a sick society. Where we got to be boldly speaking up against those people, including the senators that's a pedophile running in Vermont, I believe it was, uh, last year, blatantly out there at running for a Senate position. So how did we get this far? Does anybody, do you ever think about that? And then you think about your role in it. And think about your life as a Christian. How, how and I don't, I don't wanna condemn anybody, this is not about that. But if we've been like this, our whole Christian walk, and we've been in the hills and valleys all the time with our faith, with our, uh, with our holiness, with our separation from the world, 
every time we hit the low, we brought Satan into our lives. And every time we hit the low, we joined the world that was doing this to children. Now, I have to say that because I pray that whoever hears this later will hear that message and go, wow, that's me. I partook. I was sitting at Jesus's table, but I walked off to go get a little drink off that table. And that table is contaminated with the poison of demonic wisdom. So, so the church is sleeping and God is doing everything he can at this point to wake us up. First Peter 3, 2, 2 says that all things, God created all things by, through, and for Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject to him. That's all the scripture I need to know to say, Jesus, will you release these things into this atmosphere to take this territory for us? Send your angels to battle. When was the last time you actually asked for God to release angels or invoke angels into the atmosphere? When was the last time you thought about, this is not to be critical, it's just this is to get us thinking. The last time we thought about, I'm going into that territory, how am I going to take that? I'm going to ask God to send something in there to take it first. Shut the mouth of the lions. Make it quiet. And I promise you, I've seen this happen. I'm going through another journey, a, a personal journey in my life where I'm seeing it happen again. But I went through something um, before I was walking with the Lord. And God literally, it was like he stopped time for three months to make a way for a certain individual to go to heaven and to, to get saved again, to, to turn their lives around. He used me, a sinner, a person not walking with him, a person who knew him and believed in him, but didn't live like that. And he used me to shut the mouth. He would shut the mouth of the lions, and I'm not even gonna tell you who those mouths were, but he would shut it all up around me and get me up and get me moving according to his will and his purposes. And I didn't even know I could hear from God. And that, that's because my heart was right, because I wanted what was best for that person. So I had already yielded all my junk to just get real with helping this person. I understand it now, I didn't then. So God can use us even when we're not in the right places, when our heart is bent towards something else besides self and sin, amen? So Jesus' death on the cross, visit to hell and resurrection caused him to triumph over the enemies because he disarmed powers of darkness. So again, I'm going to ask you, why does he have so much power? The Christians are the only ones that have this authority and this weapon to walk it out and take and destroy the kingdom of darkness. Nobody else has what we have. Nobody else has the kind of salvation that we have. Nobody else has the hope of glory that we have. Nobody has this that we have. There are keys. We talked about this on Saturday night. We had some pretty cool things happen that, um, that we just knew God was in the house and, he, and angels were here and they were releasing keys. And those who would receive them um, supernaturally and by faith were receiving keys. We don't know what all of them were. We didn't necessarily give a prophetic word for everybody, but he was moving. And when you see angels moving in a service, there's some cool stuff happening. God is moving. God is raising you up. God is doing something. And heaven is working with you. So Jesus' victory over the enemy is our victory as well. Only Christians' victory. We have the same power, and I say this all the time, that resurrected Jesus Christ from the dead. It's in all of us. Apostle Paul said, For I am persuaded that neither life nor death nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height or depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He never said anything about self. He never did. He shouldn't have to. It should be a no-brainer that we know what holiness is. We know what a purity is and we know how to walk it out. And if we get in trouble, we know how to reach out. Amen. All right. So going on to a kingdom divided that cannot stand. And um, this is that last chapter was about um, Satan's hierarchy and it being defeated and the reason for that is because it has been to a degree but only for the soup for the ones for the elect and that sounds so prideful but it's only been defeated for us and it's only been defeated when we fight back or else we come into bondage with everybody else amen and, and right now we're kind of looking at that i always think about how I think it was Abraham uh, or Lot. Lot was suffering in Sodom and Gomorrah or one of those towns. And um, it talked about the righteous suffering with the unrighteous. I mean, how many are feeling that? And yet we're not really physically doing anything to change it. And so my hope is that 
uh, can help to motivate some of us to do what it is that we have a stream to do it in. We, we all have something. So every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. Matthew 12, 25. Um, I don't need, I, I know people don't like to hear this, but the church is divided. Come on now, the church is so divided while the enemy is gathering up his teams and they're co-opting together when even the farthest of matters such as LGBT and Black Lives Matter have nothing in common. They found something in common so they can unite and it's called hate. So they found hate in common. We sh we're supposed to have love in common. Our love should, and I'm telling you, when the devil's hate is stronger than the Christian's love, we are in big trouble. We are in big trouble. When we can't lay down our swords that we've used against each other and pull leaders together in the body of Christ, and trust me, I try as best as I can. I have my own issues with this as well. But we have got to pull together and lay down our junk if we're going to show the world a community of love. They see the hate every single day, but there's none of us out there. I, I really think we have to be seen, not just, we have to be heard. It's great to have Facebook and all of our outlets. I love that. I blog. It's great to have that outlet. Even if only 20 people see it, it's good. But it's even better if they can see us because the Bible says they'll know you by your love. What do we see right now? We know them by their um, unity in hate. Okay, I'm, I'm not hearing much. I'm not trying to be critical against the church, but I am asking where we are. All of us, where are we? So we can suppose that demonic spirits, powers, and principalities team up in order to get the work of destruction done. They know their goal. See, if you got an end goal, you can go for the end goal because you can focus on the end result. I don't think the church has one. You know, that church over there is waiting on the rapture. I'm waiting on revival. Amen? So if you're waiting on the rapture, you really don't care about revival. And if you're waiting on revival, well, you think you're crazy waiting on the rapture. So we can't come to unity. It weren't two different doctrines, okay? It, it, we, can't, we can if we could say, well, if the rapture comes, maybe we'll be in revival when it happens. There we go. Now we can unite on that. Two scriptural points, and we can unite on that, and we can have revival. But if all we can do is point the finger and go, no, you're wrong, there's no revival coming, and no, you're wrong, there's no you know, rapture coming, and you get snapped out of here and don't have to suffer, then we can't come to unity. But we could lay down our opinion of the scriptures and come to the one conclusion of the unity of the peace of the bond of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now if we could just make that work. So, so, under the rule of Satan is an organization designed to kill, steal, and destroy everything that is good and holy. Got to remember, Satan hates God, but he hates you too. He hates everything that represents God. He hates creation. Um, I'm going to give you an example of how we would find demonic spirits working together with, well, I already kind of gave you one of those. Uh, and I'm, I'm focused on Jezebel a lot in this because that is uh, the perverse spirit with the hierarchy of demonic principalities, powers, and rulers that are under her or under it. And that is what's motivating much of what we see in the, in the nation today. But God is also dealing with it. And that's why we have this exposure of Epstein in his black book, Madam, Lady, and uh, everything else that's being exposed. So there are things being exposed because the church is praying. So we can't overlook our prayers. They do matter. A Jezebel principality may find a person of influence. I'm going to read it out of the book because I know it'll, it'll be a little smoother. Uh, within the constructs of a church and look for an opening in that person's life to attach itself to him or her and become the individual's puppet master. Does anybody look at demonic spirits uh, in a different way than fallen angels? After you've been through some of my trainings, you understand the hierarchy and the difference. Because we have been taught for years that there are demonic spirits. But if you're a seer, you see demonic spirits as little, you know, puffy, black, paint in the hind end things that just chase you down or little ticks or whatever. You see them all different kinds of things. But fallen angels don't need a body. Demonic spirits need a body. And if I'm telling you that the book of Ephesians 6, 12 gives you a hierarchy and breaks it down with powers, rulers, principalities and I'm showing you the drill sergeants I'm showing you the generals I'm showing you all the different levels what are they controlling they're controlling the spirits that need a person I hope you get this the fallen angels are active there are some that were taken care of and some that were not 
if you read your Bible very closely, and you can even see some in the book of Enoch, don't yell at me, but you got to look for revelation. God gives revelation. He'll pull revelation out of the scripture. So you kind of got to look in the scriptures to find out where are these angels at. If the spirit of, if the book of Ephesians 6, 12 gives us differences in abilities, differences in territories, how can they all be demonic spirits? Just like demons, okay? Most people don't talk about this, but the demons come from the Nephilim. They come from those that were bound by men, those children of giants and women. Go to Ephesians or Genesis chapter six. Yes, it happened. Then go in and read about David killing four more, his team killing four more giants after the flood. They're out there. They're somewhere. So there are fallen angels. So I'm going to tell you the fallen angels are the triune generals and more. They're the ones who are manipulating the spirits here on the earth that are, are, that are condemned to be on the earth and to roam. And that's how they get manipulated and that's how they affect us. So what are they? How do they get a right to us? Well, first of all, if we're not holy and we're not clean, they have an open door because they're looking for a sewage place to hide anyway. And if our life is producing more sewage than it is fruit, well, then it's going to, we have welcomed it. If that, hopefully that makes sense. So three spirits that a Jezebel spirit could use to manipulate, manipulate a person is pride, religion, and jealousy. Okay. So all three of these areas are open in a person's life, can invite demonic spirits, and then a ruling Jezebel can gain access. Once the spirit of Jezebel becomes the ruler over the individual, the effort to remove said spirit becomes extremely difficult. And this is why we must be adamant about dealing with our heart issues first so that we don't give the devil a foothold. We don't open the door for him. There's a reason. You give him a foothold here and you give him one in the second heavenlies. You become the one that they puppet in the church. And I'm telling you, I've seen this. I, I know that it works this way. I've seen it play out time and time again. Somebody in a church thinks that they're owed something. Somebody thinks that um, the pastor should be my husband. And I, how many times have you guys known anybody who said, you know, yeah, the pastor should be my husband and takes down that marriage. They convince themselves that it was of God. I know people like this. I promise you it happens. I know it's hard to believe, but it happens. How did that happen? Because pastor had a porn problem and a sex addiction and little Miss Jezebel, maybe 10 years younger, uh, had some issues of her own that opened the door to Jezebel, came in and puppeted her, took the whole church down, took the financial, took the reputation and destroyed. It happens. It happens often. Why? Because our hearts aren't guarding. Why? Because we do more in the world than we do in the, in the spirit realm. Amen? Amen? So we have to, the whole idea is to, to be rid of enough stuff to keep ourselves clean that the enemy can't use us. And he comes in quietly. I think I said this, that uh, Jennifer LeClaire was talking about a roaring lion and how she could hear it roar 50 miles away at a zoo or something where she lives. And, but yet you don't hear the snake. You know, it just comes in and creeps. And before you know it, it's around your throat. Anybody come on. That's how sin works. That's how temptation works. That's how the enticer works. Comes in very quietly and whispers in your ear, just take a look. It won't hurt anything. Or just call that old boyfriend, girlfriend. It won't hurt anything. Just check in. That's how it works. And it does seem fair It's or simple. It doesn't seem like a problem. But you know in your heart it is because as soon as you get on the phone call with that person, you can feel the Holy Spirit going, you know I know what's in your heart, right? That's the Holy Spirit saying, you know I know what's in your heart. You better hang up the phone. You better tell me. You better talk to me about this because I know what's in your heart, right? Okay. So I hope that wasn't for any of you. Call me later. Call me later. <laughs> so the adversary strategically places his delegated principalities, which has got to go to chapter one, uh, which are the chiefs in charge of a territory. Uh, and that territory could be anything. It could be the church. It could be your house. You could be a big family. It could be anything. It's, it's just, it's an area where for some reason it's going to advance the kingdom of God. So they got to stop that movement. So he positions demonic uh, powers with authority under them. These powers are superhuman. If you remember from chapter one, superhuman magistrates or spiritual potentates. That word is so funny, but it is a real word, potentate, that are delegated. Where do we, where do we know that? Okay, we won't go there. <laughs> Reeling it in, all right, or the, <laughs> it's a song. Oh, it is a song. That's right. <laughs> now I got to, oh, yeah, okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Ray, Ray, 
I forgot his name. I was going to say Ray Charles. It's not, though. Ray Stevens. Okay, I'm done. I'm over it. These, you know you, how your parents used to say, who is that actress in that show? That's it. I just had to work that out. Once I'm good. We can go, we can go on now. These powers are superhuman spiritual potentates that are delegated with administration on the assignments against the church. The, de um, the devil knows if he can block an individual, a church, a city, state, or nation from receiving a blessing or advancing God's kingdom, he will do that. All of us want to walk in the blessings of God, but none of us really want to give up what we need to give up to get that. So he finds an opening in an individual's life, be it sin or generational sin, and he sends something to that person. Think about, maybe think about some of your positions where you've been in life, and maybe you uh, were in a really good job. I know where some of you work. Maybe you were in a job of influence. Maybe you were in a job that if you had more influence, you could influence the boss and you could influence them into Christianity. And Satan is going to stop your advancement every single time because you might make a difference if you got to that next level. Perhaps you are um, in a church and you're the church secretary, but you have giftings to do much more than that. But every time you try to advance into the prayer ministry or something, something slams the door on you. Most likely there's a Jezebel or, or a spirit of Absalom working in that prayer ministry to keep you out because they know once you get in, you're going to advance that prayer ministry. Does that work for you? Makes sense, right? Okay. Politically, it works really well too, even probably better uh, blocking Christians from getting in there or getting Christians to compromise so they'll do whatever it takes to get their position and then not keep their word to the people once they get in there. So the goal is to block God's ability to bless us as a father and instead causes him to make a righteous judgment and I believe that's where we are right now. God's got to judge this. We need God to judge this. I'm not talking his wrath. I'm talking there is mercy in God's justice. And I've talked about this before, but there is mercy. If he can get us right here, a lot of people will get saved. That's merciful, right? If we can, if we can get to a point that we can turn and repent from our stuff, then he's having mercy on us to some degree. And unfortunately, it takes us getting as bad as it can get. Um, we've seen this happen with Job, actually. But these powers have a delegated influence with authority over certain jurisdictions. Their spiritual wickedness with power and strength to carry out assignments against the territory, nation, person, family, and so on. And they do this through the darkness within the places or the people. So if you go to work, say inner city church, you go to an inner city church that doesn't, that has a lot of warfare and a lot of conflict and a lot of uh, struggles within their team, you're not getting anywhere. If you join that, you're going to get sucked right into it. You have to be able to have some sort of influence to get them to pray, help them understand they, they're an inner city church with a lot of drugs around them, with a lot of alcohol, a lot of abuse, a lot of gang members, whatever might be around them as an inner city church. Not that all inner city is bad, but I'm just saying that I'm using that as an example for the territory. But let's say you go in and you know this stuff and you see everybody's bickering, but you really feel like God sent you in. Brooklyn Tabernacle Church is a good one to go read the book about them, Fresh Fire, Fresh Wind. And it kind of reminds me of what they were dealing with, not to that degree, but how they began that prayer movement to change it. So let's say you go into that inner city church and instead of folding into what it is they're already doing wrong, you begin to take authority. You begin to pray. You begin to see what is going on around there. And the whole thing gets turned around because one person stepped into that arena. One person, that's all it takes is one person to step into an arena and build a house of prayer. That's all it takes. So, uh, and that was straight from heaven right now. I'm telling you, I seen it as it was being released. And I pray whichever one in here is supposed to grab that, that has that calling and that you're being put, pushed into that place, that you will do that. You'll begin to, you know, God, okay, this is a mess and it looks like chaos, but with you, I can do all things, right? Okay, so the enemy of God gains control. Again, I'm saying this over churches, families. Anything, anything it can gain control over, the enemy can gain control over, do, does so due to the lack of Christians being Christ-like. Right? That's the world. We can see it playing out. Because society chose their own God and removed God from the, God the creator from uh, being the sovereign voice of the people, America began to spin out of moral control. And you can read this. I'm not going to go into it. If you haven't looked at the timeline, this is Satan's timeline, page 29. This is, this is Satan's timeline. Okay, what was God doing on the top of this when Satan was bringing all these things into the school system and bringing utter destruction? 
what was Satan, what was God doing when abortion and Roe versus Wade in 17, 1973 was happening and being legalized? What do you think God was doing? What do you think he was trying to say to us? He has a timeline. And these are where, this is where Satan has advanced his timeline in these places. And I take you all the way to 2019 and 2020 with the Equality Act. Satan is advancing. I'm telling you, this is, this is very prophetic right here because this is the next move of Satan. How are we going to stop it? How do we stop the Equality Act? How are we going to stop Satan from infiltrating into the church and the school system so much that we cannot do same-sex counseling? How can, we can't help anybody who's got a same, uh, you know, a gender confusion or same-sex identity issue or anything, but wants to get free, but we can't because our hands are about to get bound on this if the church doesn't step up and do something. If we keep saying, yes, church, yes, government, you can put a mask on us and you can make us bow and we'll do whatever you say and no, we won't worship God. What do you think God's going to do with that? What will you do if, if the government tells you put a mask on, you're not going to worship God? What will you do? What, what will you do? If you think about, I mean, we got to think about this. And that was on the call this morning. And I'm not going off on that because you know how I can get. But I believe this is the next play from Satan. What is God doing? We got to figure it out. We have to find out what God, this can't pass, guys. This equality act can't pass. It's already past one area. And, um, and I read in another, there's, there's several of these moves being made. Remember when I said LGBT's awful quiet? Bam, right after that, they were just exploded with activity. I sh really, we should have been looking for where they were. So sadly, many children have seen this type of disturbing behavior, such as the same-sex attraction. We had a full-blown conversation at my house today with an eight-year-old in the house about this conversation. And it doesn't faze her a bit. Why? Because it's all she knows about it. And that's terrible that she should have to know about this. It's wrong. Her dad heard about gay marriage when he was five because Bill Clinton brought it on the Cartoon Channel. Don't ask, don't tell thing. And my son came in at five years old to say, Mommy, what's gay? What's, or not gay marriage, but gay. And I, I was like, where did you hear that? The president said it on the Cartoon Channel. Really? That was 30 years ago. Look how far we've advanced. Now we have the Mark of the Beast cartoons on Netflix. We have indoctrination of, I think it's SpongeBob that's gay now. We have um, different... Um, I don't know if you guys, I mean, it's bad. It's just bad out there. So the children have seen this type of disturbing behavior. Now God's got us out of cross points. Think about it. We're at a cross point in our lives with children and grandchildren. We're going to send them back into the system to get devoured. Are we going to raise up Christian schools or are we going to do homeschooling? What are we going to do? We're talking about this in our teams because we have children and we're trying to figure out what we're going to do to not send them back to the trap. Did God give us a chance with COVID to get it right in our families? I'm sure some of us, he, he has said, I'm giving you an opportunity to get it right. COVID isn't killing everybody. 98% of people are living through it. Does it suck? Yeah, it's not a fun ride. But hey, we made it through. You make it through. People make it through. We need to do something with this. We've got to do something with this. And I believe God is pointing us back to the children, an entire generation that we're losing. 50% of millennials that left the church. We've got to go grab them. We have to go find them. So they, they have been desensitized. Soon transgender dysphoria will no longer be a generalized dissatisfaction with life in an individual's gender, but will be considered a completely normal way of life. And it already is because transgenders can run in uh, male or female sports as the opposite sex. Doesn't matter. And that's OK. That's acceptable. And, and a guy uh, today just got attacked because of the um, LGBT, because he joined to focus on the family. And I think, he's, is he a football player? He's some well-known person. Anyway, it's just you can't speak up without getting attacked. So we have to have thick skin so we will speak up. And I'm not covering everything here. There's just too much. But today, these issues have trickled into the Christian church and have caused great turmoil and division. And I'm not going to get into all of this. But last year, we've seen a lot of it with the Episcopalian churches, Lutheran, Methodists uh, that are receiving and accepting gay bishops, gay ministers, gay marriage. It's all we've already really we have lost to some extreme. Now, I think we've lost so much ground here that we're going to have to make a shift and do something completely different. Very, very radical. I believe the church needs to raise up and start schools. Without a doubt, we have to start schools. I mean schools for children. We have to. And we can't be charging an arm and a leg for it. We can't do it to make money. we got to do it to save our kids. We're going to have to do this. I'm telling you, we're talking about this. There's no other options. We just can't trust the rest of it. The, right now, they are enforcing 
um, yoga and transcendental meditation on the uh, Zoom classes in some areas. So they have room for that. They can make room, and they were doing it, I didn't even know it, at our nephew's school over Zoom. And my, my niece would take her um, son swimming, <laughs> and that would be her exercise or run out. She had to find a different way to deal with it. So the, the, and that's because the church is struggling with separating themselves from the identity of cultures such as ethnic cultures and even worldly cultures. People have become convinced that to love means to tolerate and accept, and yet Jesus warns the church the results of tolerating such seductious and evil practices, and you can go read about what he says he will do to Jezebel and those who eat at her table in Revelations. Go look. It's not nice, and God forbid we say anything that's not nice because Jesus said everything nice. He was always nice. He was smiling when he was building a whip and throwing the tables over in the temple. He's really nice about it. You will not make my father's house a den of robbers. Slap. You know, just, <laughs> he wasn't always, you know, we were just, we don't know what love is. We don't know what nice is. I'm going to say it like that. I'm going to skip through some of this uh, for the sake of time. Um, I want to point out the church of uh, Thea, 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 Attire. Thank you. We got preachers in the house. Go ahead. <laughs> Let's say it again because I think I did. Thea, Tyra. <laughs> it's hot up here. Just saying. All right. So anyway, the the principal deity of Thyatira was the god Apollo. Apollo was considered the god of prophecy, the god of knowledge, the sun, light, music, poetry, healing, and plagues, to name a few. Every time you look these gods up, they change. I, I realize I've been studying this so long. I'm like, where'd the god of music go? Who is he now? You know, I thought he was a god. You know, and I get so confused because you can't. It's weird, but they change it all the time. Uh, the church obviously fell prey to these false doctrines, possibly due to the influence of the Apollo Temple and the demonic strongmen that would have held that area captive. This is back in the day. So when false teaching and false prophecies entered the church, a stronghold was established in the church of Thyatira. This stronghold of false belief caused a swift and hard judgment to come upon them should they not choose to repent for allowing this to happen. Is God any different today? Are there some things going on that he's saying we've got to change? When a social gospel is taught, instead of the true gospel of Jesus Christ, sin is going to abound. Amen? The solid teaching of the deity of Christ, his blood for the atonement of sin, as well as his resurrection, second coming, and the power of the Holy Spirit must never be tampered with or there will be dire consequences. And I believe, again, that is where we are. And if you've ever... Um, Listen to Dave Wilkerson's, um, I think it was the early 70s, when he did that book, he wrote a book and it was all prophecy. He prophesied this future. It was amazing. It's scary to hear this man was giving warning after warning after warning after warning and nobody listened. Why will anybody listen to me right now? Why? I mean, look, this is what we have. But we have to go back to things like Gideon, where God said, get rid of all that. I only need a few of you. That's our attitude has to be that. I only need a few of you. I don't look at the big numbers because I know God only needs a few of us. Because if there's a few of us with a really strong heart and fueled towards Jesus Christ, with we want nothing more than to see his kingdom come and his will be done here on earth, we've got it. We have it. We have victory. And some of you are fully, fully committed to that call. And I know because you keep coming back. So the church of Philadelphia was the complete opposite. And I'm talking about in the scriptures of Revelation uh, to the letters to the church. This church sat in the middle of sin and persecution, just as others did. But they shunned sin and false doctrine and they refused to compromise. And that is why this compromising in the body of Christ for any reason cannot happen. Because if you compromise here, you'll compromise for the chip. You'll compromise for injection. You'll compromise at any cost. We cannot compromise the, the government is, to me right now, what we see the government rep representing is Nebuchadnezzar. Bow to me, bow to me, bow to me. And I, I don't care what people think of that. I don't care if people get mad at me about it. I don't care how many times they quote Romans 13 to me. I don't care. There are things that we're being told to do that is not healthy for us. I take us back to God again. God is sovereign. He is omnipresent. He is omnipotent, but he is not a controller. He always gives us free will. When people step in to control you and control the outcome of an entire nation, 
and all the nations attached to it. It's for no other agenda but their own and Satan's. It is not a godly agenda because God doesn't treat us that way. I mean, th he just doesn't. He doesn't cause us to conform to that. So when we vote for politicians, and I want to say this, I know you guys know this, but I want you to use this to the people that you know need to hear this. When we vote for politicians that are determined to pass laws that are contrary to God's laws, we fully give up our liberties that Jesus Christ was crucified for, and we then align ourselves with Satan's agenda. Example, President Obama. He voted several times for not just abortion, but late term abortion. He had 142 days of any kind of experience in the Senate. And if you went and looked at his voting records, you would find it for yourself. I did it. I sent email after email after email. And I warned people, you cannot align yourself with the man who kills babies that likes this. Uh, that's, and no one would listen. They did all that. I mean, like, because they have a spirit of delusion, like we talked about yesterday. So that's why, because God allowed the spirit of delusion so we could wake up. And so did we wake up? Probably a little too late. Probably a little too late, because I don't think we're, I still don't think we're awake. So we also give demonic spirits a right to rule and reign. Now think about what spirit got to rule and reign the moment we let a president come in who voted late term for abortion and lit up the White House with the, uh, the rainbow and not God's rainbow colors. What did we lose? Jezebel. We lose Jezebel, we lose Antichrist, we lose Altalea, we lose these principalities. We said, we bow to you. We put a king in place, and this is what the king wants, and we approve of it. Some of us didn't approve of that, of course. We were standing against it, doing our best, but the majority ruled, because that's how it works in our country. The majority rules. And so, now we have it. So the God of this world is ruler over the world system because we've allowed him to be so. He goes against God's design and desire for the world. And if something is put in place through the law, it is sinful opposition to God. Then the enemy has that authority. And so you can continue to read on there. And you can look at Daniel chapter 10, verses 13 through 20. Um, to kind of see the, how organizations are part of the advancement of Satan's kingdom and adversity to God's kingdom. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia. So what is Persia? A territory. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. Now this is an angel speaking. So it's happening in the spirit realm. This is not natural prince. And I have been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Verse 20 says, then he said, do you know why I've come to you? And now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I have gone forth, indeed, the prince of Greece will come. This, this is what's battling in the atmosphere. This is what's preventing our prayers. This is these princes. They're over there. They're still there. They're over here. They're everywhere. There are princes. They're just mentioning princes. But go back to chapter one and see the powers and the hierarchy of Satan's kingdom and from Ephesians chapter 6, 12. There are ruling spirits over every occupied territory that has any inkling of Christianity in it. These, and, and not only just that, there's places where Satan has thrones that he holds those places in darkness because he gains power. I'm going to take you back over the Planned Parenthood. And I could tell you I was drawn to a Planned Parenthood one night after one of these classes by myself. The Lord said, pray in the spirit, turn on your phone and pray. And I did. And I listened to my, spirit, uh, my spiritual prayer language change. And it kicked into warfare right as I hit to the corner. And then I went around and I'm like, it was creepy feeling. It was very creepy. And the Lord said, do not go in that parking lot, and, but go across the street. So I sat across the street and I just prayed, like thinking maybe the building will blow up. Wouldn't that be awesome? You know, I'm just, <laughs> I'll be, just happened to be witnessing it. And I, cause I didn't know why, why I was there. But when I prayed, I saw the Baal uh, statue as if you if you haven't seen that look it's the black one like the bull and he's holding out like this for the babies and he was sitting over huge over that building and the darkness was incomprehensible i could not comprehend the darkness and i wept and i cried and i declared and i prayed and i did all the things that god had led me to do and when i got to my home i had a very supernatural encounter with I don't know what I, I pulled up to my house and as I'm pulling up, there's a man standing in the middle of the street like this and he's just frozen. I think he's on his phone high or something, but he won't move. He won't move. He won't move. And I'm telling you this because this is the counterattacks. So he's standing there and 
I'm kind of scared, I'll be honest. I'm a little freaked because I don't understand why he won't move from out in front of my house. So I pull in the driveway and I know I gotta go through three padlocks to get in the house and my garage door's not working. So I'm like, this ain't gonna happen. I'm not gonna move fast. I don't know how this is gonna work. So I called Mike, I said, I don't know what to do. There's a weirdo standing here and he won't move. I put my lights on, he still won't move. I drive around my block and I park on the corner because I live on the corner and I park there and my lights are shining on me still frozen so I'm like oh he's one of those ice people like that Mike talks about it. he's on frozen he's on the drug that that he's frozen but he's not looking at he's just like his hands there but he's got no phone he won't move my lights are right on him now I'm starting to panic and I'm like I just did what God told me to do and I, I can't think clearly so I'm the phone keeps getting hung up try to get through to Mike at work that's never ever happened hang up click hang up click and finally he gets on the call, gets on the phone. I said, I, I tell him what's happening. He goes, well, just go in the house and lock the door. I said, you don't understand. It's three locks to get in the house. This guy could be quick. As I'm talking, I kid you not, he disappears. He's, he sprints, he's gone. I can't see him anymore. And he's down the street, halfway down a block like that. That made no sense to me. And it was while we started to pray and pray against it. And he was gone. That was a demonic assault of something. And then when I got in the house, I looked out the window, he starts heading back down the street and he's roaming like this and then he disappears. And I'm not kidding you, he just was gone. So that was obviously and clearly something I stirred up and God sent me to do this. I went by myself, I didn't do anything that was like unsafe. I had no more back, As a matter of fact, I think I had to, no, that was another experience where I had to call Deborah to pray me down because I had another experience there. But when the but I knew my battle, and so I knew I knew that I was supposed to do that. I knew that it was the Lord's battle, and the Lord had to show me that in spite of my bravery, I was still a little skittish. I still didn't know how to handle it when something that strong and the natural was in front of me. So we really are not as brave as we think we are at times, and we need backup. So we're gonna get. To, let's see. We're almost. We're gonna wrap. We're gonna go ahead and uh, wrap this up, and then we're gonna pray out. Uh, I have a prayer that I feel like the Lord released for us. Um, but I really want to make sure you get this vision um, of what a Planned Parenthood looks like in the spirit. There were lots of dark horses and darkness. I've never seen such darkness when I've seen in the spirit. I've never seen such darkness that I can't make out something except that Baal statue. That should be really eye opening for us if you believe me. If you can receive what I'm saying, if you can get that image and that territory, by the way, part of the rest of the vision was as the blood came down off of that building into the neighborhoods and out into the entire area. And right down the street from there is the how is a church that is a supposed to be a house of prayer. And I wondered why they're always buffeting, why we always struggle to build up prayer ministry there because of that. The veins just run right up into that neighborhood. All of that blood is crying out, you know, for, for God's uh, sovereignty to, to vindicate those babies. So, all right. I'm going to skip that. If you go and you read um, in Acts 16, you can... Um, you can see where uh, disputes and contention happened between brothers in Christ as they were sent out in, serv out in service. And that happens a lot when people disagree with each other because they're given an assignment. One wants to go that way and one wants to go that way. What is causing that conflict? If God isn't the author of confusion, what is causing that conflict? The devil is causing that conflict to keep us from advancing. So we have to find a way to meet each other even in our differences. Man, definitely definitely a lot of pressure huh okay so you know what that's actually that's actually it I do want to leave you with this we must take the spiritual realm before we see this the effects in the natural I believe that 100% that if we're going to see anything play out in the natural we submit it in the spirit realm we submit it to God first and then we do as he tells us to do to take the territory if I get anything through tonight one message through is that you understand if we're going to take something down for the victory for the kingdom of God, we've got to go in spiritually first. We're too quick to go in naturally. We all do it. And I say this a lot because I just don't know if we're getting that. And that is moving you to a whole nother level when you understand that. All right. So stand up. We're going to pray. And you guys have been very, very well behaved and as tiring as this must be, huh? Mm -hmm.
Yeah. Um, I pray about how to end a class and, and what we should do and just praying that you would have an impartation of something to empower you on your journey. I see some of you are battling really hard to stay awake. Um, just fit, you know, there's some, there's some conflict in this atmosphere. So I'll make sure we pray that off before you leave. All right. So ready? Father, thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We, de we declare that you are judge of all good things and of evil. And we acknowledge you as sovereign and just the one who can bring healing to our land, to our personal land, to our bodies, to our minds and to our souls, and also to our nation. We confess to you, O Lord. Confess with me, church. We confess that we have failed to acknowledge the work of the devil so that we could prevent his damaging our nation as he has done. Father, in Jesus' name, we stand before you and we confess our complacency and our fear about spiritual warfare and things of the spirit. We thank you for raising us up as one voice tonight that is no longer tolerant and no longer ignorant of the schemes of the devil. And we choose faith and we choose obedience. You said go and be in, go in faith and be of good courage. Every time you set someone in battle, Father, I pray our minds would shift tonight, Lord, that we wouldn't go in fear any longer, but we would go in faith and we would go in boldness and we would go in courage and we would leave faith behind God. You sent into battle the battle. And so we receive the same command that you sent others in with God to go in courage and faith. And we believe, Lord, that if you've begun this good work in us and in our nation, you will complete it. Though the enemy tries to thwart the plans of God, God has started we've got to remember and that is such a perfect place to go right now God created America with a good intention and he begun this place he's not done with this place we have too many souls to touch too many lives to change too much of a harvest to be uprooted and taken for the kingdom of God for God to just dismiss us right now he's not going to dismiss us and I know that there are words out there and dreams and visions and people are seeing this and that and I believe they're getting pieces and parts but I don't believe that's the fullness of the picture I believe God is also trying to tell us if my prophets who would pray together maybe we would get the full picture but we're so divided that we're not doing that so we're asked the Lord to bring us into a fullness that if the prophets won't come together Together, if the apostles won't come together, that he will raise up new prophets, new apostles to come together because we prophesy in part because we know in part. So God, we ask that you bring us vision together, Lord, that makes sense with your timeline. Father, we pray to push back the enemy's timeline. He who wishes to change the seasons and the times and the laws of God will stop and cease because God has already planned it out empower us tonight oh God empower your church to do the things you've called us you told the Israelites as you led them out of captivity that your mercy over them was not because of their own righteousness but it was because of the wickedness of the surrounding nations that you drove the enemy out and gave them land to gave the Israelites land to possess so father it isn't because of our righteousness let's just get that right church it's not because of our righteousness or our, our uprightness in heart that we ask for deliverance over our land but because we cannot bear up under this wickedness any longer that is surrounding us. And God is a God who deals with wickedness. The scriptures say that is why he chose the Israelites, not because of their own righteousness, not because of their perfectionists, not because they were upright in heart, but because he wanted to deal with the wickedness. So we are inviting God to purify our heart so he can deal with the wickedness around us, not because we are righteous in our own sake. Father, we know that as the ex ecclesia, we have provoked you, Lord, we have provoked you with our idleness and our idolatry. We confess that as sin before you and hope that you would have mercy on America and that you would forgive us, O oh Lord. Just as you extended mercy and grace to the rebellious Israelites, O oh God, when they turned to you and asked for the same thing. When they said, God, when you said that we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, we are your own special people, God, so that we may proclaim the praises of you who called us out of darkness and into your marvelous light. God, forgive us for not proclaiming your, pra your praises, God. This was your proclamation over those who would submit their lives to, to you in Christ Jesus. And we confess, can we just confess how many times we have failed to proclaim the praise 
praises of God who called us out of darkness, who called us out of chaos, who called us out of the sin and the consequences of such. And we turn today and we pray that the entirety of the ecclesia would do the same. Church, you pray with me. You pray in conjunction with me. We pray as one that the church, that the body of Christ, that the ecclesia, that the governing voices of God would turn from their own self-righteousness and realize that there is so much more that God wants to do through this little remnant. Lord, your word tells us that you do not take pleasure in evil. Say that with me. Lord, you do not take pleasure in evil and that the wicked cannot dwell with you, O God, nor can the arrogant, nor can the prideful stand in your presence because you hate all who do wrong. Because you have more such evil, you've instructed us in the way to go.